America is home to some of the most unique animals on the planet, and believe it or not, some of these very unique creatures might actually live in your backyards. Probably the most underrated group of all of North America's animals is actually its giant salamanders, of which America is home to not one, not two, but three different groups of them, all of which are incredibly unique and bizarre, but unfortunately all of them are at risk of extinction. So let's go over each and every one of these creatures and figure out once and for all how we could save the most unique group of amphibians on Earth. Starting off with by far the cutest of all of North America's salamanders, we have the Sirenidae. These creatures are called sirens because of the fact that they only have two front limbs and a tail more similar to that of an eel than a typical salamander. So basically a siren is what happens when you take the front half of an axolotl and tape it to the back half of a moray eel. Though they're actually their own unique group of salamanders not related to the axolotls at all. The reason why axolotls and sirens look so much alike like is because of the fact that they're both neotomous. This means that they stay in their juvenile forms their whole lives. Believe it or not, most juvenile salamanders actually do share this trait of having external gills, but they simply develop out of them over time. This does not happen with the axolotls or the sirens as they spend their whole lives in the water. The sirens themselves could vary massively in size depending on the species. Currently, there are two genuses of them, those being the dwarf sirens and the typical sirens. The largest of all of them is the greater siren, which could get up to three feet long which might not sound that big until you realize a three-foot siren looks like this. This is also the only species of siren I've been lucky enough to observe in the wild. While this might be a hot take, I don't care, baby sirens are way cuter than axolotls. Funnily enough, the smallest species of siren is actually the northern dwarf siren, and they get to be about the exact same size as a newly hatched greater siren. The main way you could tell the two apart is that both dwarf siren species tend to be a lot more slender and more colorful than typical baby sirens. Surprisingly though, against all odds, every species of siren is still capable of going on the land for a short period of time. Though if they were to do this, they'd simply be traveling out of necessity or entering a state of temporary dormancy, as they tend not to do too well outside of the water for a long period of time. This is because like most other salamander species, they need to keep their skin moist in order to survive. Speaking of which, they could survive almost anywhere in the southeastern United States as long as there's a clean water source. But tragically, clean, shallow, freshwater sources are becoming harder and harder to find across the United States due to all the pollutants we humans have introduced to these poor salamanders' habitats. Still, pollution isn't the only thing these salamanders have to worry about. There's actually another, even larger predatory salamander that gladly preys upon all of the siren species as a snack. <laughs> Meet the Anfuma. While they may be a lot less pretty, and even weirder looking, they're also just as important to the ecosystem. These creatures could get up to 4 feet long depending on the species, and unlike the sirens which mostly go for smaller amphibian and crustacean prey on top of occasionally smaller fish and vegetation, the Anfumas typically go after much larger prey including small snakes and these sirens. Because of that, these creatures have some incredibly freaky teeth, by far some of the most intimidating teeth of not just any amphibian, but arguably any animal on Earth. Despite their snake-like appearance, they're also almost entirely restricted to the water, with themselves only being capable of going on land for incredibly short periods of time. When they are on land, on top of slithering, they will also use their incredibly tiny four limbs in order to propel themselves. Speaking of which, we need to talk about these tiny arms. There's currently three species of Anfuma, and they could all be distinguished by the number of toes they have. That that being one, two, and three each depending on the species. But if you haven't noticed it yet, these guys have some incredibly tiny arms that make a T-Rex look like. Well, whatever this thing is. These salamanders specifically evolved to have their bodies so incredibly elongated so they could burrow through the mud and fit through small crevices more easily, both so they could hide themselves and also ambush their prey. Despite this, these large predatory salamanders are far from invincible, as they still have many predators, including the American alligator, great blue heron, and most importantly, the mud snake. The mud snake is incredibly unique in that it specializes specifically in preying upon 
upon eel-like salamanders, including the sirens and amphumas that call the southeastern United States home. Additionally, because they're going after such slippery prey items, their teeth are even more freaky than the amphumas. Luckily, for these snakes, neither the amphuma or the sirens are poisonous in any way, shape, or form. But the same cannot be said about many of America's newts, and if you want to see me do a video on those, then please get this video up to 1,000 likes. Now, before you dare think about clicking off, we have one more amazing giant aquatic salamander to talk about. And it sure as hell has a really cool name. Meet the Hellbender. This salamander could get up to 5 pounds and is actually the third largest species of amphibian on Earth. They get their incredibly awesome name from their appearance, which is unique thanks to its skin, which looks almost as if it was charred. Their skin also differs from other salamanders in how saggy it is. Their skin has this foldy appearance in order to maximize the salamander's surface area to body ratio, which helps to maximize the amount of oxygen which their skin can absorb. Speaking of water, unlike the amphumas or sirens that we've talked about beforehand, hellbenders typically prefer the cooler waters of Appalachia, mainly in the rivers which they call home. And I can confirm to you for a matter of fact that these rivers are cold because I've been in them. It's freezing. Also part of the reason why I wasn't able to find any hellbenders in these rivers is because of their incredibly well-evolved camouflage which allows for them to blend into the rocks on the bottom of these rivers and it also allows for them to slide in between the rocks of these rivers so they could hide from predators and pesky humans. These salamanders also have to be careful because they'll actually eat each other. While their preferred source of prey mainly invertebrates and small fish, these guys will gladly cannibalize on each other from time to time. They have to be extra worried about this because hellbenders lack the same sort of regenerative abilities that many other aquatic salamanders are well known for. While a siren or an axolotl could get one of their limbs torn off, only for it to regenerate a couple months later, this cannot at all happen with the hellbenders. If any vital part of their body is torn off, they will pass away shortly afterwards. Tragically, that is just one of many threats these amazing salamanders have to face. Just like the amphumas and sirens, hellbenders in addition to many other salamander species are incredibly vulnerable to pollution as their skin happens to absorb the water around themselves and by extension any sort of chemicals that happen to be in the water. That is why these amphibians are the perfect indicator species in order to determine if an ecosystem is healthy or not. Hellbenders specifically also need a very strong current in order for themselves to survive in whatever happens habitat they are staying in. This is because hellbenders get their oxygen by absorbing it through the water around themselves, so they need very heavily oxygenated water which can only come in through natural fast-moving currents which unfortunately are often disrupted by human damming. Sadly, habitat loss is something many different species have to worry about, including the three main groups of salamanders that have been talked about in this video. Thankfully, despite how much we humans have altered their environment, and despite how sensitive each of these creatures are, they still still against all odds manage to persist, not just in a modern day, but also into our own backyards, sometimes without us even knowing it. Now, I love talking about amphibians, and I also try to make animal mini documentaries every single week, so please like, subscribe, hit the little hype button, because YouTube is my main source of income, and if you want me making more awesome videos in the future, then I'm going to need all the support from you guys I could possibly get. With that being said, hopefully I'll see you all real soon. Goodbye.